Hello! Here, I'm going to be rebutting a fairly old video on a topic I've really wanted to cover, the Euthyphro Dilemma. The video has the prophet of Zod, an atheist, arguing that the dilemma is inescapable, while critiquing William Lane Craig's response to it. Zod, or can I just call him Zod? Does it have to be the prophet of Zod? I'm going to call him Zod. He, he seems like a nice guy. I can relate to him a lot. You know, he has a weird head, I have a weird head, we have a lot in common. His head is static and mine is a square, but it's the same idea. Which makes me sad to hear him insult the integrity of William Lane Craig, a man I generally admire, for a solid 11 minutes. You see, Zod seems to misunderstand Craig's argument, and subsequently accuses Craig of dishonesty and willful obfuscation. Once you get past the exterior polish of this well-dressed and articulate confidence man, you find he says practically nothing of any intelligent substance. So hopefully in this video, we can set the record straight while explaining how to avoid the dilemma. Let's jump into things. Let's dive straight into an example of Craig's elaborate way of not explaining anything. In this case, he's going to try to work his way around the Euthyphro Dilemma, a pretty unavoidable logical bind that shows why an objective morality could not come from God. I'll let Craig sum it up for you. Well, that's a dilemma posed in one of Plato's dialogues to people who say that goodness, moral value, is based in the gods. Uh, Socrates asks Euthyphro, do the gods will something because it is good, or is something good because the gods will it? If you say that the gods will something because it's good, then the good is independent of the gods. It's not uh, dependent on them at all. But if you say that the good is whatever the gods will, then that seems to be an example of might makes right. They could have declared something totally different to be the good. And so it makes good and evil arbitrary, which seems wrong. That was a reasonable explanation, but I want to reiterate in language that makes it crystal clear what the options are and what it would take to get around them, just in case Craig might try using semantics to obscure the nature of the dilemma. Spoiler alert, he's totally going to. Boiled down to its bare essence, the problem here is that morality either has to come from inside God or from outside of him. If it comes from inside him, it's only his personal will or opinion, making it arbitrary instead of objective. If it comes from outside of him, then he's not the source of morality and invoking him to make it objective is meaningless. So if Craig wants to justify grounding morality in God, he needs to either 1. Show that morality comes from somewhere other than inside or outside God, or 2. Explain why these consequences don't follow from the two options. If we keep in mind that this is what it boils down to, his attempts at obfuscation are going to look pretty silly. But let's give him a shot, huh? Hmm. The term inside God is pretty interesting. Like, God isn't a room that you can go inside or stand outside of, so the prophet of Zod is relying on a sort of intuitive understanding of what it means for morality to be inside God. This is fine since he's trying to boil the argument down to its basics, but the inherent ambiguity does pose the danger of Zod getting confused about Craig's response if he holds to this formulation of the dilemma dogmatically. Spoiler alert, he's totally going to. It's not the case that God's will something because it is good, nor is it the case that something is good just because God wills it. Rather, God wills something because he is good. So when faced with the question, is it good because God wills it, or does God will it because it's good, Craig offers as a third option, God wills something because he is good. But this statement doesn't even address the same topic as the first two. And I don't even mean it's a bad third option. I'm saying that, as phrased, it's totally irrelevant to the question of where good comes from. If anything, his statement that God equals good just takes us back to square one, where we must still answer whether he's good because he defines that goodness or because he conforms to an outside standard. Of course, Craig's going to clarify soon, but he's definitely assisted by this added layer of linguistic confusion. I actually agree that this statement by Craig is unnecessarily confusing. It makes total sense if you already understand what he's saying, but it's too poetic to be elucidating if you're hearing it for the first time. I personally would use this as a closing remark rather than an opening remark, but that's mostly just a personal preference. However, it's a laughably unwarranted claim that Craig is trying to deliberately confuse his audience with this comment. That is to say, it is God's own nature which determines what is the good. And once Craig explains what he means, we find out that his third option is actually just a rephrasing of the first option. Morality comes from within God, but in slightly different words. And we'll get back to the semantics behind this soon. 
but I hope you're starting to see the strategy here. Basically, Craig's just constantly rephrasing a string of non-answers or bad answers so quickly and in so many different ways that people start to lose track of the fact that he's not getting anywhere. So now the definition of inside God is creating confusion. Who would have predicted that? You see, Craig is not giving a non-answer, nor did he simply rephrase the idea that morality comes from inside God. Let's actually take a step back. The argument theists are giving is that morality must be grounded in something. There is something in reality that has a special connection to morality, making things moral or immoral. What could the special thing be? Well, how about the will of God, or to put it another way, the decisions of God? Murder is immoral because God decided it was. Well, this is just the Euthyphro dilemma. Decisions are made for reasons. If God had a reason for his decisions, those reasons really are what ground morality. If God had no reasons, morality is just completely arbitrary. What Craig is saying is that God's decisions are not the thing that stand in a special connection with morality. It is God's nature that fills the slot of what grounds morality. So, Zod's diagram can be extended. There are things which are grounded in the decisions of God, and things which are grounded in the nature of God, and things which are not grounded in either. Now, morality is not inside the decisions of God, but it is still inside God, if you will, because it's in his nature. This isn't a slight rephrasing. Morality is still grounded by an aspect of God, but God makes no decision whatsoever about what should or should not be moral. This completely changes the categories. Love is moral because it is grounded in God's nature, but God did not decide to make love moral. Now, if God doesn't decide to make something moral based on reasons, does it still face the problem of arbitrariness? Well, no. Arbitrariness happens when someone makes a decision without any reason to. Since there isn't any decision being made, there is no arbitrariness. Like, 2 plus 2 equals 4 isn't true because someone made a decision, so it can't be arbitrary. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is just true because of mathematical necessity. All the theist is saying is that because of metaphysical necessity, there exists this relation between God and morality, where God's nature grounds what is moral. If you're wondering why God possesses the nature that he does, or that this nature grounds morality, the theist needs to posit the metaphysical necessity of these things. That's a fancy way of saying that you've basically hit the bottom and you can't go any deeper in explanation. Metaphysical necessity applies to a variety of questions, such as, why are the laws of logic true? That can't be answered beyond that it's just necessary that they are true. It's not that these things are arbitrary or unanswerable, you just can't get any deeper. What we're trying to do is go as deep as possible with morality, and theists are positing that at the bottom you find God's nature. God is by nature essentially compassionate, just, fair, kind, loving, and so forth. And because he is good, his commandments to us reflect necessarily his nature. What Craig is saying here is very interesting. The reason that God makes laws like love thy neighbor is because his nature, which informs morality, also informs his decisions. So God is going to give morally perfect commands, but these commands themselves aren't the things that ground morality. What Craig did here is pretty key. Look carefully at the attributes he assigns to God. He mentions compassion, justice, fairness, kindness, and love. Now, of course, God has many other complex attributes that I'd say are given at least as much weight in the Bible, including jealousy, tribalism, the expectation of worship, concern over how tabernacles get built, and a hankering for the smell of burning animals. But Craig knows that these seem either morally problematic or morally irrelevant. Uh, seriously? Okay, speed round. Jealousy. God loves you and knows that your greatest pleasure would be found in him, so he doesn't want you looking for happiness in false gods. Tribalism. God cared about creating a set apart people through whom he would bless the world with the Messiah, which reconciled the world to him. Love again. Expectation of worship. See jealousy. Concern over tabernacles. God set up complex rules for the Israelites to reveal through symbolism his various traits such as holiness and justice. Hankering for animal smoke. Institutionalized sacrifice made the Israelites aware of God's infinite justice and how the wages of sin are death. This also foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, an act of infinite compassion and kindness. So, these other traits are extensions of the ones we already recognize to be good, but understanding this requires digging into some biblical studies. But what's the point of this? Why can't we just go straight from noticing these traits have practical value to practicing them? Why take this diversion through God first? And why attribute them to God when there are perfectly clear secular reasons for choosing them? This is a good question. There are secular reasons why something gives more pleasure or suffering, or is more or less practical, 
But without some thing playing the special metaphysical role of grounding morality, then there is no secular reason that something is moral or immoral. I plan to do a more thorough examination of this distinction in a video on the moral argument. And therefore, the uh, commandments of God and our moral duties are rooted in God's essence. They are not arbitrary. They are rooted in God himself, but they aren't grounded in anything external to God. God is himself the good, who is the source of our moral duties. So now, finally, we get to the substance of Craig's answer, which is that good is determined not by God's will, nor by anything outside God, but by his nature or his essence. At this point, I was so sure that Zod would come around to understand what Craig is saying, but then he said this. Now I know what you're probably thinking because you're not f***ing idiots. Is God's nature really any different from his will? Well, technically it is different in some ways, but not in any relevant to this discussion, and shifting the problem from God's will back to his nature does absolutely nothing. Because if your will is a determination you make about how something should be, then your nature is nothing other than a collection of traits that drive your will. So really, all Craig is doing is using a slightly different vocabulary to express the same idea. Which is why I wanted us to remember that morality had to come from either inside God or outside God. So, Zod thinks of God's nature to be so similar to God's will that shifting from one to the other doesn't solve the problem of arbitrariness, or even change the question. This obviously isn't the case. God's nature informs his will, but it isn't identical with it. God's will is contingent and composed of various decisions. God's nature is necessary, unchangeable, and not composed of decisions. This means that God doesn't need to come up with reasons for love to be moral, nor can he fail to come up with reasons. It's not a decision. He necessarily is loving, and necessarily his nature informs morality. So necessarily, love is moral. To illustrate, imagine I have a bunch of friends over for a dinner party. And when they arrive, I demand that everybody sit in pre-assigned seats and eat in total silence. Now naturally, they're going to ask why the f*** I'd expect them to do such a thing, right? So what explanation could I give them? Could I just tell them that it's my will that they do so? No, because as explained in the Euthyphro Dilemma, my will is arbitrary and based on my whims. Okay, but then what if I, like Craig, got the really brilliant idea to tell them that my nature was such that I enjoyed silence? Would that make any progress whatsoever toward demonstrating that my command was objectively right? Of course not. All I would be doing would be explaining my arbitrary reasons for my arbitrary command. Absolutely no philosophical advance was made by shifting from the use of the word will to the use of the word nature. This analogy is just confused. Zod is treating this shift to God's nature as if it's being used as a way to explain why God wills what he does in fact will. It's because of Zod's nature that he wills people into silence, just as it's God's nature that he wills what is moral. But at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it's not about what God wills. Nothing about God's decisions goes into the what grounds morality slot. It's his nature that's in that slot. The fact is that stating something is moral just because of being wills it is nonsense. And Craig's attempt at slapping a band-aid over this problem by distinguishing between God's will and his nature is even more transparent nonsense. Yes, it seems untenable to say that morality is grounded in the will of a being. Guess who would seem to agree completely? Hint, his name rhymes with Schmillium Lane Craig. The distinction between will and nature is not just a superficial band-aid, but presents a crucial distinction being made that completely defies the category of the original question, a distinction Zod doesn't seem to understand. Basically, Craig explained nothing while serving up rapid-fire reiterations of nonsense and hoping he could cloud the field with linguistic ambiguity, which is pretty much what he does. So the Euthyphro Dilemma remains unanswered in spite of an attempt by the most revered Christian apologist. And it will remain unanswered because it's unanswerable. Because the idea of objective morality being generated by God is nonsense. Anyway, I hope this was helpful or at least interesting. I appreciate Vice Rhino letting me present on his channel, and I appreciate you sticking around to watch. If you like what you saw, you can go subscribe to my channel. And if you didn't, then I guess that would be a waste of time, so don't. Have a good day. I personally did find it at least interesting. I really do enjoy these kinds of philosophical questions, but I can't say I like the copious insults that Zod hurled during this, especially since the reasons he presented for his insults namely that Craig is willfully obfuscating the question, are completely misconceived and actually based on misunderstandings on his part. 
Anyways, remember kids, morality is grounded in the nature of God and not in his decisions. That which is moral is not good because God decides that it is good, but because he is good. See, Craig, that's how you do it. By the way, if you ever see this, that was totally a joke. Anyways, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Please hit subscribe if you enjoy this content.